It is really great to be with you again. This is my home away from home at this point, I think. I just love that sharing that we just got from Northern Ireland. Uh, just the idea that, you know, God does supernatural things to multiply what's happening. I, I just came from uh, 10 days in Istanbul. And uh, I don't know if you guys know, we have a bunch of vineyard churches in uh, Turkey. And through them, a church in Baku, Azerbaijan, and through them, a church in the, in the country of Georgia. And uh, God is doing amazing things. Like we just, it was just story after story after story after story of people encountering the power of God and God just turning their life upside down and bringing them to faith. I mean, these are Muslim countries. Our church in Baku from January 2020, which is just before the pandemic began, through two years of pandemic to the present day, has baptized, I'm talking about baptized, these are serious converts, 124 people. And almost all through some kind of supernatural encounter. And the Lord is moving in power there. I mean, they, ha they have basically a Middle Eastern megachurch. There's over 400 people coming to the church. Um, and they don't have enough room. And they, they've got church planners, you know, in the pipeline ready to get going in the near future. And the interesting thing is they have basically uh, no materials, nothing. There's no books on church growth. There's no books on church planting. There's no books on theology. They have literally nothing but their Bibles and the Holy Spirit. Huh. <laughs> well, with that in mind, uh, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Now, uh, this is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. If you go back to the book of Acts, you'll, you will note that right before Paul went to Corinth to evangelize there, he was in Athens. You can see the story of it in Acts chapter 17. Apostle Paul goes to Athens and he tries basically to match wits with the philosophers and the purveyors of culture in the city of Athens, which of course was one of the preeminent cultural cities of its time. And I think we could probably agree that the Apostle Paul was no intellectual slouch. Uh, probably one of the most intelligent men of the ancient world. And it was basically a disaster. In you know, attempting to uh, engage with the philosophers and the culture in Athens, he basically laughed out of town. A couple of people did get saved by the mercy of God, but there's no letters to the church in Athens. From there, he went to Corinthians. And this is the way he describes the sort of the change in his orientation as he goes from Athens to Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning verse 1. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness with great fear and trembling. I, th I think he would be right in there with you from Northern Ireland there. Weakness, fear, and trembling. Verse 4, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, 
but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. So that, so that, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. First of all, it's all got to be about Jesus and centered on Jesus. Okay, it's, it's not about us. It's not about being cool. It's not about being relevant. It's not centered on anything other than Jesus. It's all about him. And... The th of course, the interesting thing is that, as Paul says, says us elsewhere, you know, Jesus himself is an offense. You know, uh, craziness to the Greeks and blasphemous almost to the Jews. And yet he says, that's it, nothing but Jesus. I'm, I'm just sticking to Jesus. That's the thing, that's everything. So it's all got to be about Jesus. I think, you know, it's interesting. I've lived, I lived through the Jesus movement in the 70s, and I've watched all of us. I've kind of gone for the ride along with the rest of the church in America and largely over here as well. And it, in the beginning, it was all about Jesus. But somewhere along the line, we lost the Jesus part. And it got to be about, you know, who was the best speaker and who had the best skinny jeans. And never wore a pair of skinny jeans in my life. <laughs> anyway, it's all about Jesus. Second thing, and this is important it's not about being strong or persuasive. Or culturally appealing. Which kind of comes on the heels. You know, uh, uh, my third church plant was in the inner city of Chicago, and it basically was not going well. Every day I felt like we were failing. And the funny thing was, while we were going through that, God kept saying, I'm calling you to plant hundreds of churches. And I kept saying, uh, I think you got the wrong address. Like, uh, uh, haven't you noticed, like, I'm trying to do this one, and it's not going? Like, I'm not going to live nearly long enough to do what you're talking about. Like, and God and I wrestled for five years. And finally, God blabbed to some of my friends who got me in a corner and made me confess what I was, what God was saying to me, which was, I think God's telling me I'm supposed to plan, be a part of planning hundreds of churches. And I felt ashamed and embarrassed to even say it because it seemed outrageous and prideful and not at all um, explainable by anything that was happening or by me in any way. And I was mad at God when I went home. Like, why did you do that? Why did you tell them? <laughs> why did you let them get me in the corner like that where I had to tell them? I mean, they got me in a restaurant booth and wouldn't let me out even to go to the bathroom until I told them. <laughs> and God said, don't you know, don't you understand it's not about you? Um, it's about Jesus. And how, it's not about how big you are. It's about how big is your God. And I, I think that's one of the first things I really want to say to you. Uh, whether you're thinking about being a church that plants lots of other churches or whether you're thinking, well, you know, is God calling me to do that? It's actually not about you. It's not about how big you are. It's about how big your God is. And we sometimes resist God because we just think we can't do it. Well, guess what? You can't but your God can, and all he needs from you is yes. That's it. Yes. I don't know how you're going to do it, God, but yes. And
And that's what it finally came down to. I just said, God, well, like, I'm failing now, and this seems really ridiculous, but uh, yes, if you put it together, then yes. And it happened. In all kinds of crazy, supernatural ways. You know, when I look back, I'm now retired, so... Which is interesting because retirement is actually much busier than not being retired. <laughs> but a lot more fun. But when I look back at the 45 years I was leading a church, all the fruitful things, all the wonderful things, all the things that have lasted and endured and had an impact were things that were done because of God intervening. Things that happened in some sort of supernatural, surprising way. All the stuff that I did by my wisdom and strength were basically not worth the time. They, they just weren't worth it. They're worth the time. You know, uh, I, I've started talking to people about if you're going to be in ministry, you need to learn how to sail and stop rowing. By rowing, I mean trying to make this all happen by your own effort and your own smart. If I read a few more books and figure out a few more tricks, then it'll happen. And it's exhausting. You know, like you do that for a few years, you think, I'm tired. And I'm thinking, well, yeah, you're tired. You're doing all the work. But when you're sailing, what do you do? You put your sail up, and the wind does all the work. Learn to sail. You know, Jesus says, I will build my church. He doesn't say, you will build my church. He says, I will build my church. You just need to say yes, and then put your sail up and let Jesus build his church. Just keep saying yes. Let him carry you. You th and people say, well, won't I be too passive? I said, trust me. You will not be passive. You might be praying for a little boredom just so that you can have a break. But you will not be passive. You will be very busy <laughs> keeping up with Jesus. So learn to sail. Third, he says, we point to Jesus through a demonstration of the Spirit's power. I think that was very much true in the first couple centuries of the church and very much true now. There are no real arguments uh, from a rational point of view that, that will actually convince people of Jesus in a postmodern context. There's nothing quite like flopping on the floor like a fish for a couple of hours to solve that problem. And it was working pretty well across the Middle East where people are getting saved in droves. So we point to Jesus through a demonstration of the Spirit's power. Why? And then he says, genuine faith has to rest on God's power. He says, so that, all this is important, so that your faith will not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. When your faith is built on God's power, there's no need for deconstruction because it wasn't built on anything human in the first place. It's, it's what happened to you. It's what you've seen and heard. And I just think we need to have more people coming to faith through a demonstration of God's power. Then it becomes unshakable. And for all those reasons, I would say the church must be experienced as being a supernatural church. Like, it's got to be supernatural. It's got to be visibly, experientially, a supernatural church. If, like, if, 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 if there isn't the realm of the unpredictable somewhere in your church where anything could happen at any point in time, then why go more than occasionally? 
if you know already, they're going to sing the same songs. I know what cycle they're on. I know what set, set list they're using. I know what the sermon's going to be. If it's all predictable, why be there? But if God might come and do something unexpected, I don't know, that's a different story. I think the church has to be experienced as supernatural. And when the church is experienced as supernatural, generally explosive things take place. And the church grows like crazy. So how do we build a supernatural church then? And here are my suggestions. One, I think you got to start with prayer. We got to start with prayer. Like every move of God, every supernatural church will point back to a time of prayer. Prayer underpinning the work of God. I've said many times, you can't expand your ministry beyond the base of prayer. So I wonder if we have enough prayer going on to support what we hope will happen. I'm right now praying for God to raise up a little army of intercessors in every one of our churches who will pray for God to move and for people to encounter the Lord in a supernatural way so that they can have an unshakable faith. I think it has to start with prayer. Um, one of the things I love is the brothers in Baku, uh, they had an outpouring of the Spirit on, on Pentecost Sunday this year. They had been praying as a church, fasting and praying. I don't know, have you ever called your church to a whole church fast? It seems to be also part of the pattern. I hate fasting. But I sure do love the results. So, um, anyway, they had fasting and prayer for the whole church from Easter to Pentecost. On Pentecost, there was an incredible outpouring of the Spirit like they've never seen in their church before. And the very next thing that happened is one of the key leaders was led by the Lord to start a prayer group. And he calls them the guardians like the guardians of the galaxy. But they're the guardians of the work of God here in Baku. And they pray two hours, uh, two hours a week. They get together and they pray for two hours. Once a month, they pray all night long. And the 14 people that are part of the guardians, so it's an elite group, uh, are on call to pray for any emergencies or anything that comes up at any point. So their commitment is, is if you call me at 2 o'clock in the morning and say, we need to pray for this, they wake up and pray for that immediately. So they're kind of on call as guardians. And I think it's very interesting that the first thing that God led them to in that process is to more prayer. Second, it's important to repent of unbelief. You can have unbelief and not know you have unbelief. The very first time I, uh, I saw John Wimber, well, you know, I guess I have to give you a little background. You know, I grew up in a Pentecostal church. So, like, I heard about the Holy Spirit from, like, three days after I was born, three times a week thereafter for the rest of my life. Because you went to church three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. And if you missed one, people were checking up on you to see if you had backslidden. So three times a week. I started speaking in tongues when I was an 11, which was a little bit late. A lot of my friends started when they were nine. You know, but I knew something about the Holy Spirit. You know, I had an experience with the Holy Spirit. And if you'd asked me, do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I'd say, yeah, of course I do. Like, I'm a Pentecostal kid. been speaking in tongues since I was 11. But I'm in this meeting with John Wimber. And he gave what, in retrospect, was a wonderful talk on leadership as servanthood. 
which I'm thinking, boy, not enough people heard that talk. And uh, then he gets to the end, and he says, I think the Lord wants to do something here today, so everybody just stand, just relax. You can. And I was really surprised by the lack of hype. Like, there wasn't any music. There was no band. He hadn't told any stories of, you know, that really kind of got you emotionally. It was just flat as a pancake. And I thought, well, this will be interesting. I've never seen anything like this before. And then he says, Holy Spirit, we invite you to come. And we're waiting and waiting and waiting and we're waiting. And eventually, you know, he says, see the Holy Spirit coming on this guy. And something happened for a guy and his wife. And that, that was kind of, and then that died down. And we're waiting again. And this woman over here behind me, she's in the row behind me, about five seats. She starts shaking her hands like this. And I'm thinking, oh, where are the ushers? She's got a problem. You know, I knew it. California, home of weirdos. Uh, just all kinds of judgmental things about her. And because I didn't understand what was happening. And all of a sudden, John Wimmer says, this time a little more forcefully, like, now receive the Holy Spirit. And it was like a fist hit me and just about knocked me over my chair. Like, I mean, just, I was like tottering. I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall over my chair. I'm going to fall. And so my first thought was, I have to regain control of my body right away so that I don't end up look, looking like her. That was my number one concern. And then I thought, hey, since when does God hit people? I just got hit. Like, whoever said God was a gentleman lied. Way lied, in retrospect. Then I thought, oh, yeah, Apostle Paul knocked off his horse, struck blind. It could be worse. Um, <laughs> and then I thought, hold on. That was real. That was really real. That wasn't like some spiritual reality. That was physical reality. That was real. That was really real. And in that moment, I realized that somehow in my heart, in spite of growing up Pentecostal, I kind of thought, the Holy Spirit was maybe, you know, an emotional state you got into or a spiritual reality kind of somewhere in the air or an abstract concept, you know, to help explain the Trinity. But I never thought he was real, really real, like physically real, like physically here real. And I realized that I needed to repent of my unbelief, that I basically didn't believe in the reality of the Holy Spirit. And when I repented of my unbelief, there was a wave of power that went through my body. And really nothing's ever been the same since. Um, I was talking to somebody recently, and uh, this person observed, they said, you know, I've talked to a bunch of you old guys from the Wimber days. And he said, there's something you all have um, that I am not sure the rest of us have. You guys all have this sense of the physicality, the physical reality, the physical presence of the Spirit. And I said, yeah, that's right. That's what we got. Like, we, we sense that. So I wonder if maybe some of us might need to repent of our unbelief before we can move forward to have a supernatural church. I think then next 
we need to have our own personal Pentecost. I mean, Jesus said, don't go, don't leave Jerusalem, don't even try to do this thing until the Holy Spirit comes on you and he will come with power. You know, uh, this is a multiply conference. You, you know how we got so many church plants in the early days? It was because John would like do conferences on signs and wonders and we would all go because we wanted to see signs and wonders. And we'd get to the signs and wonders conference and then God did a sign and wonder on us and called us into church planning. <laughs> like, you know, he kind of set us up. And then God got us and called us into church planning. We got ambushed into church planning. We didn't get talked into it. It's not like there's some better financial package in church planting. You know, it, it's like, we were compelled because the Holy Spirit fell on us and we had no choice. We were compelled. I think we need to do maybe more signs and wonders conferences where people can get ambushed by the Holy Spirit. Then number four, we have to wait. I was really, really pleased the way we waited tonight right from the get-go. I think in general we don't wait enough. We're not waiting on the Holy Spirit or we wait too late. Like when you get to the end of your service and you're ready to, you know, do the ministry time, if you're waiting then you're already behind the, the game. You're already too late. You should have been waiting from the get-go, from the first note. Well, actually, your whole life should be waiting. You should constantly be waiting for the move of the Spirit. You should constantly be looking. What is he doing next? What is he doing next? What's next? My whole life at this point is all about waiting and looking for where is the Spirit moving next? Not just in a meeting, but outside of the meeting, because like oh, he gets around. One point in Istanbul, we're at a restaurant, and I'm I am not one of those people that tries to evangelize all the waitresses and waiters. Okay? Like I know some people are like that. That's not me. When I get there, I want to eat my food. Usually there's a person I want to talk to and I got an agenda with them and I don't want the waiters to interrupt us. You know, coming back every three minutes, is everything okay? Well, it was. <laughs> so usually that's my idea. Like the best waiter is seen and not heard. Anyway, we're there. And I look at the waiter and like, Boom. Oh, look at that. The Holy Spirit is working on him. What are you doing, Lord? What are we what are we doing? You know, oh gosh, he's like on the verge of despair. The guy's so sad. He's so overwhelmed. So in the end, we ended up having a conversation with him, and sure enough, he was, you know, a young guy, he was like 19 or 20, and he was supporting his entire extended family by himself and was just uh, desperate. And God was showing his love to him that day. So I'm just, it's like we wait, we need to wait always. You know, uh, John 5, 19 is a sort of the theme verse of the vineyard. It's sort of like Jesus said, I tell you that the son can do nothing of himself. He can only do what his father's doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. Um, as far as I know, that is the formula for ministry. That is it. That is the formula for ministry. 
See what the Father's doing and do that. So every day I'm waking up, okay, what works are we doing today? I'm ready. Lord, I'm ready to say yes. What are we doing today? And then the next day. And I want to encourage you to do more waiting. Wait at the beginning, the first note. You know, uh, there are certain moments that happen sometimes in our worship. We're singing a song, we're going along. And all of a sudden, like the lyric that we've sung a bunch of times before, but today the lyric is on fire. We sing that that line, that stanza, and suddenly people are sh- crying or they're shaking or there's, there's something that's happening with people in that song. The p- p- spirit of God is starting to come like, don't go to the next stanza at that point when you hit that point. Like, wait, you just, you just stumbled on the thing that God's doing right now. Park there for a little bit. You know, at least repeat it a couple of times. You know, we have this rule, like if you pray a prayer for somebody and it hits them with power, pray it like five more times. You know, pound that sucker home. Because God is in it. Well, like you do that in the worship. Because God is in it, you know. Or you can, you might just stop and say, hey, everybody, The presence of the Lord is just coming in the room. Let's just stand before God in silence for a few minutes. You know, or let's say the song is like, you know, the lyrics that's on fire today are, he sets us free from all our fear. Well, why don't you just stop right then and there and say like, hey, the Lord is like, speaking to us that he wants to set us free from our fear. Everybody here who's been struggling with fear this week, raise your hand right now. All across the room, people will be raising your hands. Then pray against the fear right then. Like, don't, don't wait till the end of the meeting. That, the Lord is moving now. And you know what? You can do all of that and still keep your contract with your child care workers at the other end. You might not do the last song in the set that you were planning on, but nobody is going to care, except maybe the band. It's really important to let God put your teams together. One of the things we learned early on was putting your teams together by human wisdom is going to be a painful process. Letting God put together teams supernaturally is you get way better results. So we, anytime we're trying to add a new person to the team or expand the team, we're looking and praying for God to supernaturally call people into those places. And we've never regretted any of those choices. All our regrets have been when we relied on what we thought, the person we knew, the warm body that was available, those kinds of things, uh, those kind of usually came back and bit us. But if we would be waiting on the Lord and looking for him to put our teams together, uh, amazing things would happen. Some of you sitting here today, your biggest problem is you don't have the person you need to stand alongside you. Your team is got holes in it. And because you don't have the full team that you need, it's difficult because you are trying to fight a war without half of your army. You need to pray and wait on the Lord and expect him to supernaturally call to you the people you need to work alongside. And if you will wait and persist in prayer, God will call people that you never expected. He will call people maybe you never met before. He will call people from other parts of the country, other parts of the world, other movements, um, wherever he happens to have people. God will call people and put them with you and help you 
build what God is building there. So it's very important to let God put the teams together. It's important to let God direct you to the harvest. Most of the time, what most churches do is we try to find the harvest by just shooting at everything and hope something works. And there's a whole lot of disappointment and frustration involved in that. But the interesting thing is when you look at the book of Acts, that's not how it happens. They didn't just try this. Oh, let's try this. Oh, let's try that. Uh, well, the Jews aren't responding to that. Well, let's try the Gentiles. That's not how it worked. It was like the Holy Spirit directed them. So when the persecution comes, you know, Philip, the evangelist, says, uh, goes down to Samaria, and that's where the harvest is. There is a sense in which if you will let him, Jesus will show you where the harvest is. About 15 years ago, we had just moved into our building. And uh, all of a sudden, somebody called up and said, what time is your Spanish service? We didn't have a Spanish service. We weren't thinking about having a Spanish service. We had no plans for a Spanish service. We had never thought about having a Spanish service. And so the receptionist says, no, we don't have a Spanish service. But the next day, several more people called and said, what time is your Spanish service? And the next day, even more people called and said, what time is your Spanish service? She started keeping hashtags. When we got to about 35 or 40, I thought, hmm, I may be a little slow here. <laughs> but it seems to me God might be trying to tell us something. Like, we got half a church already. We nearly got 50 people asking us what time is our Spanish service. So then I thought, okay, well, let's see. What do we got that we can use? Oh, I know. I got two guys that I know speak Spanish. So I thought, well, we'll go with that. We'll just start with what we got. So I go to these two guys, and I say, like, you know, we got all these people who called us and said, what time is your Spanish service? And we don't have a Spanish service, but would you like to try a one-year experiment? just to see if we can get one going. The two of you would have to like do all the preaching in Spanish and you'd have to get it going, but maybe something will happen. And they said, okay. And that was 15 years ago. And from that time to this moment in time, half, a full half or more of all the baptisms in our church have come from that congregation. So that worked out pretty well. <laughs> Lastly, you got to train your people for spirit-led ministry. You know, the, in modern realities, you turn your church over about every three years. Towards In three years, it's not the same church. You know, well, we used to have a flip, flip over rate of, you know, 30% every year. Um, pandemic did weird things to that. Um, in some places, slowing it down, other places, hurrying it up. Like if you're in London, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of people said, I can work from home now. And if I can work from home now, I'm not living in London. <laughs> you know, we had one woman, one of our church planners in Los Angeles, had her entire 30-person church planning team left in 30 days when that happened. They all got the notice from their work. Um, hey, uh, you can work from home from, for the indefinite future. And they all said, well, if that's true, we're not going to live in L.A. We're getting out of here. And they moved to all kinds of other places. She got her another team back. The Lord brought other people to her. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a big turnover. So you, the point being, if you taught about healing or praying for the sick or receiving the Holy Spirit or any of the basic kind of vineyard stuff five years ago, most the majority of the people in your church never heard it. Like, so you have to keep finding, you have to find some way to keep training people over and over again. And lastly, I just think 
if you ask him to come, ask Jesus to build the church, he will. You know, uh, when we came into the vineyard, we'd been praying for two years for a revival. And uh, it finally came, you know, after that trip to California and, you know, finally repenting of unbelief, coming back to the church. You know, we had a church meeting with our little group of about 100 people, and half the church ended up on the floor, shaking and crying and screaming. And, and uh, But people started getting healed, and people started repenting of their sins. And it was glorious. You know, God was convicting us of sins that we didn't know were sins. He was convicting us of all kinds of things that stood between us that we were really not fully conscious of. And uh, as we kind of got into that season, it was, um, it's really hard to describe how sweet it was. It just felt like God was so close to us. It was like floating in a sea of God's mercy. And the mercy was so tangible. I mean, it was tangible. It's like you could feel it in your with your body or taste it with your mouth. It was so tangible. You like wanted to find some sins to confess just so you could get more mercy. Because <laughs> um, the mercy was so wonderful. I mean, it was just so wonderful. And I wish that you would know what that's like. And uh, we had a meeting of our leaders, and God said, okay, you got the revival you've been praying for, but if you want it to keep going, you're going to have to give the church back to me. And... Uh, let me deal with it, what I want to do with it. And that was a big problem to me because I started the church so I could have a church that I could stand going to. And, to be honest about it. And uh, my first thought was, wait a minute, if I give the church back to God, what if he changes it? What if I don't like it? Which is how we all react when God is calling us, right? What if I don't like it? But I couldn't for the life of me figure out how in the world I was going to maneuver saying to Jesus, I want to keep your church for myself. <laughs> so finally said yes through gritted teeth and just waited. And, it, and then it was just one thing after another after another that he started addressing and changing and speaking to us about and eventually called us supernaturally to join the vineyard and be a part of the vineyard, become a vineyard. And I, I told my father at the end of the year, I don't think he liked our church very much because we gave it back to him and he changed everything. But it's so much better. And it was, it turned out to be the wildest ride, the most incredible experience that you could have in your life to just follow him where he was taking us. And that's the last and most important thing about being a supernatural church is you determine to let him take you where you never thought you would go and to obey in everything. 